All right, thank you, Lisa, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to present today the, to the UFS workshop. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking my co-authors who are listed here. They've done the lion's share of the work that I'm about to present today, and there are, uh, several of them also have talks uh, later on in the workshop to elaborate on some of the overview material that I'm going to show today. So uh, I appreciate all their hard work that they've done. Um, all right, so the motivation here is that uh, within the UFS, the three to five year vision is to have a physics suite that is essentially unified from the convection allowing scales to the global scales, and that includes the 25 kilometer S to S grid spacing. Um, so to be able to do that, uh, your physics have to scale well across a, a very wide range of scales, and they additionally have to be able to work well across the convective gray zone, uh, which spans from uh, roughly the CAM scale to about 10 kilometers. Um, and in addition to that, there's been several priorities that have been pointed out for improvements within the UFS weather model uh, by Weather Service and other partners. And uh, some of those uh, you know, priorities are exemplified by these three case studies that we've selected here for further analysis in this project. Uh, so those priorities include improving hurricane track forecasts, accurate prediction of uh, two meter temperatures, particularly for heat waves, uh, and also the uh, uh, improving the representation of convection, uh, particularly at the CAM scale uh, within severe weather events and providing accurate QPF. Uh, and so, you know, to look at how the horizontal grid length impacts the ability of the UFS weather model. Um, to handle some of these forecast challenges. We've run simulations at uh, three, 13, and 25 kilometer uh, grid lengths for uh, several versions of the GFS and GSD physics suites, and I'd like to show you those results today. So a little bit more on the method. Uh, I won't go into great detail on what all of these different versions of the GFS and GSD physics um, entail. Uh, the, the primary differences are summarized here on this slide. Um, for looking at the results, essentially what I'd like you to remember is, is that the earliest version of the GFS physics that we're showing is uh, what we're calling GFDL-MP, basically the version 14 physics plus the GFDL uh, microphysics scheme. And the most recent version that we tested is the proposed version 16 beta physics. Uh, likewise, there's also a progression in physics suite maturity for the GSD physics, uh, going from version zero, an early version of the physics, um, to a version of the GSD physics that uses the NOLSM, uh, as well as the MYNN surface layer. Uh, so these were regional simulations conducted with the short range weather app. You can see the domains that we used here. CONUS domain was used for that severe weather case as well as the heat wave case, while a domain uh, similar to the one used in the UFS hurricane application was used for the Hurricane Barry case. So uh, I'll start by showing a few results from the Hurricane Barry case. So uh, what you see here is the uh, performance of the operational uh, version 15 GFS, and each of these colored lines represents a single cycle of the deterministic uh, GFS forecast, and you can see that there's a pretty substantial right of track bias. Um, even though we were running regional simulations uh, with the SRW app, we were pretty readily able to reproduce this right of track behavior that we saw in the global system. And something that's interesting that we observed is, is that although in general the performance improves as you go from the early version of the GFS physics uh, to the version that's proposed to be used in version 16, uh, you can see that you know improving the or, or making the grid length finer doesn't really give you much bang for your buck. In fact, several of the best forecasts were performed by the 25 kilometer grid length, which might be somewhat surprising. So why is this? Well, if you look at the ERA-5 reanalysis, you can see that this was an extremely sheared system. Most of the convective activity was displaced off to the, the south of the center of the storm, um, which is indicated in the center of the plot. If you look at how the convective distribution looks within the model simulations, you can see there's actually quite a lot of variability uh, in where that convective aggregation occurs and how it's positioned relative to the center. 
in some of the runs with the porous track forecast, you actually get convection uh, that wraps into the upshear left quadrant and ends up focusing pretty close to the center of the storm, which is not what the observations tell us actually occurred. And you can see it conversely in some of the runs with the best track forecasts, like the 25 kilometer runs for version 15 and version 16 beta, uh, you have the convection displaced a good deal to the south of the center of the storm, like in the observations. Uh, so essentially what's happening here is that greater convective aggregation to the northeast of the center pulls the storm off to the northeast and away from the best track. Uh, and I'd like to call your attention to a talk being given by Nick Leibarger tomorrow he is going to talk more about the vortex dynamics involved in this case and, and why that occurs. So the second case that we looked at was the heat wave case uh, that occurred in, in midsummer of 2019 over the central plains and Midwest. Um, for this case in operations, you can see that the operational GFS was a good five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the analysis shows, um, whereas the operational NAM actually gave a, a pretty solid forecast for, for this event. Um, when we attempted to reproduce this case within the short range weather app, we, we actually weren't able to do that. Uh, if you look at the forecast from uh, our GFS version 15.2 uh, runs, uh, it actually does a pretty solid job representing the event. Um, and, you know, this could be for several reasons. It could be due to the use of lateral boundary conditions in the regional system. It could be that by the time GFS was upgraded to 15.2, some of those upgrades going to 15.0 to 15.2 made the difference. Um, however, if we look at the performance using the GSD physics suite, this is the earliest version of the GSD physics suite, we found that there was a pretty pronounced over forecasting uh, bias for the heat wave case. Uh, temperatures sometimes exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, with the version of the suite using the RUC LSM. Uh, however, in a later version of the GSD physics suite, when RUC LSM was replaced with NOAA, we actually get a very reasonable forecast. And our takeaway from this is that you really need to uh, use an LSM that's compatible with the initial conditions that are provided by the parent model, which is GFS in this case. So uh, I would stress that anyone experimenting with the GSD physics consider using NOAA LSM for their simulations. But lest you think there's nothing really to gain from looking at this case, um, something that we found that was interesting was that the PBL heights in um, the three kilometer runs of both versions of the physics are actually quite a bit greater um, at the three kilometer grid length as compared to the 25 kilometer grid length. And when we looked into why this was, one hypothesis that we have is, is that if you look at the vertical, vertical motions occurring, occurring within the boundary layer um, on the three kilometer scale, they're quite a bit larger, both from an upward and downward perspective uh, than in the 25 kilometer runs, which look relatively quiescent by comparison. Um, so this greater mixing within the atmospheric boundary layer and the three kilometer runs we suspect is the reason why we see greater PBL heights at the three kilometer grid line. Uh, Lin Lin Pan will have a talk tomorrow to elaborate on some of these uh, things that we've seen in this run. So the final case that we looked at was a severe weather case. Uh, there were a couple of different modes of convection during this case. Uh, one was uh, predominantly linear in the southern half of the, the domain. Um, the boundary layer was fairly dry and well mixed, and this caused the propagation of, a, of an MCS that started in the Texas Panhandle and entered into Oklahoma. Um, whereas in the upper Midwest, there were more supercell-like structures that occurred along a quasi-stationary frontal boundary. Um, and those led to some tornado reports. So looking at the representation of the convection in several of these runs, GFS physics on the left, uh, GSD physics on the right, uh, you can see that as we might expect, the you know, representation of convection is not so great in the 25 kilometer runs, but it, it actually looks you know, more realistic in the three kilometer runs. Um, one thing that I'll point out as I you know, put, put the OBS up for this case, is that if you compare the two, you'll see that there's a distinct lack of stratiform precipitation in, at the three kilometer grid length in both GFS version 16 beta and GSD physics. This is something that the team is going to look into in, in more detail um, as, as, as we enter into the second year of the project here. So looking at the uh, QPF forecast from these runs in a little bit more detail, uh, so domain average precipitation on the Y, forecast lead time on the X, 
Uh, the dashed lines show you the contribution uh, from the convection scheme and the runs. Solid lines show you the total uh, precip and the black line are the observations. One thing that we see in both physics suites is, is that you go to, as you go to finer grid lengths, uh, you actually get an increase in the total amount of QPF uh, that's produced by the physics. Um, and as you might expect, you end up getting a decrease in the contribution from the convection scheme, which is certainly something that we would expect to observe. Um, and why this is requires some further investigation. And Michelle Harold will have some more information on the results from this case uh, tomorrow in the verification session. So I encourage you to attend that. So conclusions, uh, I won't I have belabor three minutes. These. Uh, Thank you. Uh, conclusions, I won't belabor these points too much. Um, but the main you know, thing that I want to say is that at least in their present form and in the way that they were configured here, neither of the physics suites that we analyzed are scale invariant. Um, we should certainly expect that there's key aspects of the forecast that are going to differ um, at the CAN grid length versus the S2S grid length. So perhaps more tuning is needed or uh, greater physics development is needed to truly have scale aware physics that um, provide a seamless transition uh, from three kilometers to 25 kilometer grid length. Um, and the last thing that I want to say is, is that this project is continuing, and of course the DTC has many other projects as well um, that visitors can get involved in. Uh, there is a program, uh, and we do have an announcement of opportunity out on our website, and this uh, opportunity includes salary support, uh, both for principal investigators as well as graduate students. So if you're interested in that, uh, I'd encourage you to apply and look at the announcement of opportunity. Uh, and I can certainly provide more details on that if you're interested. So uh, thank you. I think I used up all my time here for the talk and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Tracy, do we have a question? Yes, we've got a couple questions. The first question is from Ben Cash. Why compare the simulations of convection in the hurricane case to ERA-5 particularly the three kilometer runs, as opposed to a data product that is closer to the same resolution? Yeah, that's a, a good question, Ben. Um, so yeah, getting at Ben's point, I think the resolution of error five is about a quarter degree. Um, so, you know, we've tried a few different things in, in doing this comparison. Uh, we've regridded to 25 kilometer grid length and done the comparison with error five. Um, we've also shown the, the raw results as well. I believe these are the raw results. Um, and it really doesn't change the, the conclusions too much. Uh, so even though error five is relatively coarse, um, you know, I think the, the main conclusions, the main trends are still valid. Um, to answer the question of why, uh, this, you know, this comparison was done while the storm was over the ocean. So we didn't have a whole lot of data that could be used at high resolution. So getting the land-based radar data, for instance, for the case wasn't an option. All right, thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Ji Sun. Uh, how the subgrid precipitation is derived? I don't remember they are in the GFS model outputs. So, yeah, the subgrid precipitation is uh, essentially the amount of precipitation that's produced by the cumulus scheme. And that is something that is output directly in the right component files from FE3. And you can easily pipe that through the uh, unified post processor to get something on a, a regular grid. Um, thank thank you. you, Evan. One more question at this time. I think we're going to have to move on now, so uh, we can follow up, follow up on the Slack, and maybe you can also give some pointers to Shia on how to to get this output. Okay. Um, so our next. Okay, great. Our next presentation is from Jin Wen Bao, and the topic is theoretical basis for stochastic uncertainty representation in the UFS. Right. So let's see back. Great. You will see your screen and 
If you can put it in presentation mode, then you're good to go. Thank you. Excellent. You all hear me okay, I take it. So what I'm going to present we can is hear you. the work that we have done as part of our ongoing development the project that is to provide a theoretical basis for stochastic uncertainty representation in the NOAA's unified forecast system. Before I go on, I'd like to mention uh, the PSL team, um, Sarah Michelson, Lisa Benson, um, Theo Kajan, Jeff Whitaker, and Cecil Pellan. Besides the PSL team, this work has been carried out in close collaboration with the EMC Ensemble and the Stochastic Physics team. So I began with uh, um, the requirement of stochastic physics development in the USS. And I put forward the unified framework for simulating uncertainty in separate physics permutation, which is the core of the theoretical basis I just mentioned. Then I will provide preliminary results from testing in the unified system, which is followed by conclusions. There has been consensus among all the major centers of NWP using stochastic physics to account for model uncertainty is it required for at least three reasons. Reason number one, to mitigate model error in data simulation. Reason number two, to improve the probabilistic scale of ensemble forecast. And reason number three, to develop a good, reliable S2S stochastic prediction methods. Before uh, the UFS took form, the PSL team led by Jeff Whitaker had implemented the full stochastic physics scheme in the then the spectral uh, global model, TSM, now uh, migrated to the UFS system. Uh, the four uh, schemes are listed here. One is called stochastically perturbed physics tendency based on what's developed at the EMC, uh, at the ECMWS. The second is stochastic kinetic energy backscatter scheme, known as a SCAP, which is all followed by the approach developed at the CMWF. We have our own schemes. Um, one is a stochastic perturbed boundary layer humidity scheme, shown. Uh, we follow the, the approach put forward by Tom Haynes and Werner. We also have a vortex confined scheme, confinement scheme based on Shantes et al. developed at British UK Met Office. So, so we have four schemes here, all use uh, stochastic random pattern generators to generate spatially and temporally correlated noises. So in the spirit of simplified code of UFS cooperation, this work is to develop a unified framework for simulating uh, uncertainty in separate physics permutation because if you uh, look at all the schemes, they all uh, deal with uncertainty rooted in unresolved separate processes. So the best, uh, a good point for us to start is to look at all the separate parameterization, uh, physics parameterizations and see if there is any way we can unify all of them, just for the sake of simplifying uh, operational suite. So how we do it? Fortunately, there has been a, a good development in mathematical physics, uh, which is uh, can be shown here based on the constant uh, graining model to reduce the resolution through um, this so-called mathematical uh, semi-group notation. So in semi-group notation, a model can be generically expressed here uh, with a initial conditions, and the model state in general can be decomposed into resolved and unresolved. If we do that, and we write this equation, the model equation with the initial conditions, in terms of so-called the Louisville equation, all of this is in terms of semi-group notation. So you just take it as what I'm saying here, but the bottom line is, is that it works and that there is a theory behind it. And I'm going to show you an example. So if you use this approach using a Louisville operator, you end up with a 
an equation by using so-called moritz monsica project operator to map the model into uh, a, an expression of the tendency just in terms of resolved variable. So in here, P is the projection to map the entire model variable into the grid of resolved variable. And the Q is projection to map the entire model variable into the subgrid variable. So there is partition here. The key point to make here is that the entire expression of the model tendencies for the result of the variables have three terms here. One is a result of dynamics. The I is a local perturbation or local evolution. And the middle term is called memory term that, is, uh, that represents the interaction uh, between the resolved and unresolved processes. That is, is important. So to further explain what this means, let me use, in, let me use a elementary differential equation theory uh, to further illustrate this. Okay, if you take the following linear, uh, the linear equation here, if we denote uh, blue as resolved and the red as unresolved, okay, we follow the recipe of such a solution and you end up with this last expression here. Okay. That's just elementary, ordinary different equation theory, nothing more. This shows that if you want to account for subgrid processes, you must need to include in the expression in terms of tendency and memory term. So this equation is termed in uh, physical literature called uh, generalized Langevin processes. So in the physics, uh, physics literature, stochastic process described by the general expression of the model equations as I shown a moment ago, is called the generalized Langevin equation. And the process described is called multidimensional Langevin processes. In general, two approaches have been pursued and developed in the literature to reduce the entire stochastic simulation of model uncertainty based on the generalized Langevin equation to something simpler and tractable because the whole expression I have just shown is so complex and intractable, just like a model general equations, you cannot get a general solution. So the two approaches that people have used to reduce to is one, other aggressive models, they are of two, can be one and any number higher, one. And the second is other aggressive moving average models, they are M, R, Q, and P. Now these are standard models, uh, which means that if you have enough data, if you have enough knowledge about how subgrid processes are supposed to behave, and you have ways to construct a memory term, and these methods are good for uh, reduce um, your general equation to something that's tractable. So you follow the literatures, one can conclude that the minimal form of the multidimensional Langevin processes for model uncertain simulation can be expressed as ER of one process. Okay, basically the perturbation that associated with subgrid model uncertainty is made of two terms. The first is the correlation term, that mu is the evolving time scale. And the second term is multiplicated noise, okay, which involved the uh, tunable parameter based on the standard deviation of the uncertainty and with a random number of the Gaussian distribution. And it, symbolically, uh, it is the time step. Now, the fact is that despite the fact that I expressed this term, the local term, as multiplicative noise, but in general, it cannot be that case, it can be more generalized as any perturbation you realize, such as using stochastic parametric perturbation as PP or any other parameterizations, like what we have done, seen, for example, set of the automata. So, we put this method into the GFS and the using uh, the uh, GFS base 15 configuration. And that's all that would we get as an example snapshot of stochastic perturbations at the forecast time 48 hours for a given one, okay, at about 500 millibar. 
and the panel A is the uh, temperature for the vision, and the temp, uh, panel B is moisture, temp, uh, panel C is U component, and D is the D component. What you can see here is that what we provide is basically a backscatter of perturbation in model variables associated with the subgrade processes. Now, uh, three minutes. Good. I mean, time. So now this is ensemble forecast. So we use this method to do. And we're using um, the C384 resolution, which is 64 uh, levels, to compare with already implemented available SPPT. And you can see that uh, the um, control is black, and the red is the uh, multi-dimensional run processes, and green is SPPT, solid line zone means to a dash is the spread. You can see that without any tuning, that we have MLP uh, produce results that is better than the SPPT. Now, I must make a, a cautionary remark. What we try to promote here is not just because the MLP can intrinsically produce better results because if you give enough time, people can kill SPPT to produce similar results. The advantage we are promoting here is the unified framework and the simple implementation. Similarly, you can look at the uh, U component and MLP performance in a comparable way with SPPT, which means that we have confidence this method can be used as a unified framework to replace the four methods eventually as, as we plan. To further look at the, how this can be done, uh, we can be used, method can be used to look at a subsystem forecast. This is a single realization of MLP to compare with SCP and the control in terms of the day uh, simulation, the single resolution I showed for the ensemble. And you can see that the uh, daily main bias of precipitation in the tropics um, is this, you know, have the similar characteristics as SPPT. So, the conclusion is that it's comparable with SPPT. Similarly, with frequency distribution of daily mean precipitation in the tropics, and you can see that the in the um, medium intensity of precipitation, MLP actually is better than SPPT. Also, in the heavy precipitation end, MLP is not as good as SPPT. But we have not got any for the tuning yet. The bottom line is you can make MLP perform as well as SPPT. Conclude, we have developed a unified theoretical framework in the USS to account for uncertainty in separate physics. The unified theoretical framework is based on the application of multidimensional rendering process, we call MLP. Uh, despite at the time, I did not have time to uh, mention this, but an MLP can be used to simulate any processes on separate scale, including turbulent fluxes. For those people who are interested in this point, I can show you more. Our preliminary testing in NOAA's USS showed promise in increasing ensemble spread while reducing the mean square error by using this method. And this method has a promise to produce required skills in S2S forecasts. That's all I have. I look forward to questions if there is time. Thank you, Bao. Uh, Tracy, do we have a question? Um, Tracy, are you there? Yes. Okay, a Sorry. question from Arun Chawla. Would this approach okay, also go ahead, then. Ocean asking about MLP versus SPPT? So the question is, what's the difference, right? Mm. Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Would this approach also work in the ocean asking about MLP versus SPPT? Yes, but we have not tested it in the ocean. And the, uh, the MLP is more general than SPPT. I forgot to mention, uh, thanks Aron, for this uh, question. Uh, SPPT is a simplified variant of general MLP. So our plan is to have MLP tested, implemented and tested for the entire couple of USS. 
Although the results I'm I showed is the atmosphere component. A second question, thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to have to move on. Uh, Tracy, uh, we're going to have to move on. We are at time, but well, there are more questions for you waiting on the Slack if you look there. Okay. Uh, our okay. next presentation is to be, um, you're welcome. Our next presentation is from Lee Zhang, and she's going to talk to us about the development of GAFS aerosols into NOAA's unified forecast system. Hello, can you see my uh, screen? Maybe, uh, we can see your screen. Okay. Yes, you can uh, put it in presentation mode. Okay. Mm. Yeah, perfect, okay? thank you. Oh, so, sorry, I cannot see my... Yes, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Today, I would like to talk about the development of a uh, GAFS aerosol into NOAA's unified forecast system. First of all, I would like to acknowledge all of the co-authors for their efforts and input in developing this model. It is well known that um, recently, the air pollutants either come from the anthropogenic uh, activity or come from the nature source, such as dust storm or volcano ash, they do play an important role in impacting the human beings. And a lot of study has been shown that PM 2.5 exposure has become uh, one of the major global health concerns related to uh, the additional causes of the death. And published um, in um, 2018, uh, it's using the global exposure mortality model shows that um, it, it is almost like a nearly ne uh, linear association at higher concentration PM2.5 exposure. We can see from this slide, yes. And on the other hand, due to the um, aerosol direct and indirect feedback on the atmosphere, um, the concern rates um, about the impact of aerosol and more complex uh, chemistry on weather forecast and climate. And the NOAA's operational air quality prediction in National Weather Service contribute to protection of lives and health in the United States, which requires sub, um, uh, which requires a sustainable development and improvement of global forecast system for operational um, aerosol and uh, air quality prediction. With the selection of the new dynamic core of FD3, uh, chemical component of a GSD can was coupled online with the GFS model. And this is the GSD can is based on the warp can mo uh, model. And it has been placed as an ensemble member into the GAFS system um, and as a an, uh, GAFS aerosol. Uh, that's uh, uh, a lot of uh, like a uh, person has been uh, introduced about this uh, yesterday. And this will replace the current operation of global aerosol system, the NGAG. Yeah, this model has been using the new opposite to um, to couple with the GFS uh, F, uh, the FB3 GFS model. And in the chemical suit, it, it's including three um, different um, chemical mechanisms. Now, what we are using now is based on uh, the aerosol module is based on the go kart model, and it has been in the real time uh, for more than one years. And other than that, we will also uh, test another two scheme uh, to including the gas phase chemistry and the SOA. Uh, in the future. At the same time, um, the operational EPAC MAC model has also been uh, coupled using the new opposite into the global and regional um, FB3. About, uh, for, about aerosol for, uh, forecast, um, I'm, not going, uh, uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but I would like to highlight some updated um, compared to uh, WARFCAN and the uh, GO-CARD uh, model. One thing is the convective, uh, the tracer convective transport and wet uh, deposition has been included in the SAS scheme. And for the emission, the global anthropogenic emission, now we are using the SAS 2014 version. Uh, about the biomass burning emission, um, we are uh, updated to use the GBBPX uh, emission with FRP data. Uh, they, uh, it's about also based on using the prom price module. For dust, uh, emission scheme. Now we are using the Fungsa dust scheme developed by AIL. About the computation time um, at HERA, we, uh, the test we did is based on to, uh, 25 kilometer for seven days forecast. It takes about two and a half hours. Here is the details about the uh, repository of our most recent version and uh, the corresponding document. 
And why uh, we uh, up update those emission here? It is some anthropogenic emission comparison. The left column is the um, set emission based on 2014, and the right column is the H cap based on the 2010. And from this comparison, we can see that the set emission obviously have more global coverage, especially more shipping emissions over the ocean. However, we also see um, that the set emission is much larger over the Eastern Asia, but actually uh, the emission over Eastern Asia is decreased recently. So here it, it is some of the buyers. And from Barry's talk yesterday, uh, we know that AIL now is working on improve this set emission with a much newer version, uh, which will be help, helpful to uh, reduce this uh, uh, emission uncertainty. And we also did some um, comparison to compare the impact of different biomass burning emission. And um, the, the left is the old, uh, modest uh, plus FABA uh, the fire emission, and the right is the GBB PX fire emission. So by uh, using these uh, two different emissions, we can see that the AOD biases compared with the um, ICAP analysis data has been significantly decreased when we're using the GBB PX emission, especially over Eastern Europe and Northwestern America. And also uh, the low bias over, uh, over South Asia has, not, has also been reduced when using the GBB PX emission with chrome price. Mm. Here it's a uh, five months uh, average the day one AOD prediction of the gas aerosol model and uh, in the current NGAC model that we compare with the MERA2 reanalysis data and the model is the satellite observation. So we can see that the gas aerosol is able to capture the major protein area with high AOD, such as the uh, South Africa um, um, and, North Af uh, and North Africa, that's the South region and Eastern Asia. Uh, here, it is some inconsistent in the modest uh, uh, data, that, but we, uh, I think it's mainly, uh, it's mainly due to the satellite retrieval over the North Pole um, due to the high uh, surface albedo. From um, the buyers of this day one AOD prediction that's average over these five months, we also uh, compare the gas aerosol result and NGAC prediction with the uh, MERA2 reanalysis data and the NASA GEOS 5 model. Now, obviously, that the NGAC shows significant low bias uh, globally. Well, uh, our gas aerosol prediction show less bias. And the largest bias is mainly um, over the South uh, uh, Africa area, which is due to uh, the fire emission. And another one is over Eastern Asia, as I mentioned, that's the anthropogenic emission in the current set emission, and still have some uh, uncertainty, which will be improved. Um, other than compare this five months AOD average, and we also uh, compare the daily valuation of the day one prediction AOD uh, versus the Aeronet observation. So this yellow line is the gas aerosol, and the green line is the uh, um, NGAC. The, the black line is the ICAP analysis data. Now from the comparison, we can see that the gas aerosol shows significant improvement compared with the NGAC result. And it can also capture this uh, uh, high peaks AOD, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this peaks of higher AOD due to the fire event over South America. And another area with a large fire uh, event is the uh, South uh, Africa. Here it's uh, a site over South Africa. Now, obviously, GAFS also is able to reproduce the total AOD temporal variation as that of the uh, aeronet observation and even much better than some uh, uh, than the ICAP analysis data at some of these sites, let's say like here. And uh, like overall that's uh, again, uh, NGAC indicates and uh, uh, indicate and, and the prediction during the whole fire seasons over South Africa. So other than uh, validate the uh, uh, AOD prediction, we also validate the model, uh, con uh, the model predicted aerosol concentration compared to this atom aircraft measurement which has been launched in uh, 2016 summer this is the map of the atom flight checks 
So from the uh, organic carbon column sum, which can be uh, represent a fire impact, we can see uh, here we did like three different experiments um, by using two different fire emission models versus the GB, BPX emission and different re resolution of like uh, C384 versus C96. Now we can see that the GAFs uh, um, aerosol model can capture this uh, fire from our Atlantic, so that's quite consistent to the um, to the observation. And from the resolution uh, comparison, we can see that it's there. Uh, the differences are quite small. And um, other than the uh, organic carbon, we also compare the dust column sum. Here are two different uh, resolution predicted by the model. Um, overall, that we can see like a slight lower bias over North Atlantic, where is the downwind area of African um, dust region and Pacific, where is the downwind area of Asia. Again, so the resolution impact is not such significant, only slight difference being shown uh, in, by using different uh, resolution. And this is the um, atom flight track. Lower Atlantic from uh, South Atlantic to North Atlantic. From this comparison, we can see that for OCVC and sulfate, that's the uh, model show very good in uh, performance in reproducing these vertical profiles, especially the location of the fire plumes. However, the fire plumes are uh, underestimated in our model. And also we the slight, uh, we can see slight uh, over prediction in the up level, which may due to the strong velocity, uh, ver vertical velocity in the FC3. From the dust comparison, we can see that the gaps uh, aerosol can capture these dust plumes. A uh, compare with NGAC, that is overestimate um, everywhere. And the seesaw prediction is also quite comparable to the observation. This is the map of the flight track uh, over United States from Minnesota to California. Now again, like all, all the model prediction are larger than the atom observation throughout this flight track, which is due to the estimate of, of anthropogenic emission uh, over United States, especially the Western United States, which has been shown in yesterday's Barry's talk. So here is the summary, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not go, I will not go through it, but I will highlight some corresponding um, study uh, by using the gaps aerosol. That's Barry will give a talk about that scheme. And Bob will give the data, uh, aerosol data simulation this afternoon. Sam will talk the aerosol feedback tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for this presentation. Um, Tracy, do we have questions? I do not see any questions uh, directed to Lee. Okay, I'm gonna give it a few more and see if anything comes in. Okay, well, if not, then we're going to move on to the next presentation. This is a presentation of uh, this session, and it's going to be by Barry Baker. And he is going to us about forecasting dust emissions using the UFS implementation of the NOAA ARL Fengxia Dust Emission Scheme. And Barry, we can see your screen. And the presentation looks good. You can go ahead. Okay, so um, as um, Li Zhang was just talking about, um, we have a new system for global aerosols, and we're also going to be able to do this both at the regional scale and global scale. And so the, the dust emission scheme that's being put into operations is the NOAA ARL FUNCSA scheme, um, which is also used for the national air quality forecast capability. So, you know, why do we care about dust? And we already, you know, explained this a little bit, but, you know, it can alter radiation budgets and effects and formations of clouds and precipitation. It can act as transport mediums for nutrients, fungi, viruses, bacteria, um, you name it. Um, and it can reside in the atmosphere for, you know, hours to weeks. And so, you know, this is something that can that we need to have a good understanding of. So um, recently, you guys, pro everybody probably saw this, but there was a huge dust storm in June that's 
They're actually seeing a second wave at the beginning of July. Um, it was in all the major news media. And so I wanted to use this as a motivation slide to show that, you know, our model one can pick up this type of event, but two, it does, you know, it can impact much farther regions and global on the global scale. So, you know, what is the FUNGSA dust emission scheme? And there's this is a busy slide, but I want to draw your attention to the bottom left equation. Um, that's essentially the entire scheme in one neat little aspect. And it's essentially just the horizontal flux times a source term times the vertical to horizontal mass flux ratio. But what makes FUNGSA unique is how we set our threshold velocity. Um, how we, we set our, most dust schemes set their threshold velocity based on a knowledge of what the size distribution of the soil particles are. And that's, that's something that's not really well understood, especially spatially, let alone. Um, and so what we've done is we've actually gone back and used uh, field and wind tunnel measurements to constrain our model to be able to um, model this, you know, with some type of constraint. And th the other thing that makes FUNGSA unique is our new source term. So we developed a new sediment supply map so that we can tell where dust is going to, where the probability of dust is more likely to occur. And so that's the, that's the next thing I want to talk about. And so this is this is an example in um, July of our sediment supply map, and so what you can see is over vegetated areas in Central Africa, um, it's essentially zero because we don't expect any dust to occur there. But over like the Bedelli Depression or um, other areas like that, you're, you're seeing a really pronounced contrast where these are alluvial systems that are known to produce a lot of dust. And so we're, we have pretty high confidence in this new sediment supply map. Um, and just to compare quickly, um, this is another sediment supply map put out by Perigili and Zender. And what you can see is that there's a, a much higher contrast between um, sources and not sources. Um, so just jumping into you know, a little bit of model verification, and so what, what we're looking at here is essentially the six months of correlation coefficients at major dust sites at Aeronet locations. And what, what we can see is that we're seeing most Aeronet locations with a correlation coefficient of you know, 0.6, 0 0.7. Um, and if we switch to the next slide, you'll see what NGAC shows, and you can see a clear benefit to um, our the new dust emission model in that we're able to get much better correlation than the operational system right now. Um, so we're, we're really excited about this new dust emission scheme. And so just to go into a more of a, a case study approach, um, th there was a big dust event in early February actually, where it we had this ejection out of uh, Morocco and it actually spread up and went out over Europe. And on the right hand side, you can see the Tenerife Aeronet location and just comparing. So in blue is the GEFS aerosol, in red is the Aeronet data, ICAP is an ensemble um, analysis, and NGAC is the operational model. And what, what we can see is that. FUNGSA is able to reproduce this event, capture the same thing as the um, ensemble member analysis. And, you know, there's actually points where we're, we're able to predict higher um, aeros aerosol concentrations than even ICAP is. But at the same time, we're, we're missing some. So, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about where the dust scheme is going to go in the future. And one thing that we want to do is move on from 
a traditional Z naught approach for the drag partition to something that's more dynamic in that, um, in this case, an albedo based approach that was published in Chapel and Webb in 2016. Um, and the idea is that instead of the traditional Z naught, you can essentially use light propagation to describe the roughness elements of the surface. And so um, in the right, you can kind of see that view. And this is the, uh, the top panel is the raw pock model for um, essentially turbulence due to a roughness element. And in the bottom is essentially the same thing, but if you put it into a 3D um, cone or cylinder and you shine a light towards it, that shadow would be the same thing as the turbulent wake area. And so what we're, what we're able to see is that we're able to get a larger spatial coverage and it's more consistent with the sediment supply map. It's dynamic and it can be updated in near real time. Um, so that's, that's where we would like to go. Um, and of course, you know, we, some of the other updates, we're gonna update the um, soil data set for dust emissions and also update and improve the threshold values that are used. Um, and I wanted to cover one more dust event. So this is the this is that same dust event that I talked about earlier. And essentially, there was a large dust event over northern Africa. There was actually multiple locations that produced large amounts of dust. They combined and then transported over the Atlantic Ocean towards North America. And so, you know, one we were able to produce this dust event. Um, in the top left, you can see the um, Veers image of the just the, the visible spectrum, and you can see the dust transporting out over uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And in the bottom panel, you can see what is going into operations in our GEPS aerosol. And what you what you can see is the same kind of spatial pattern where you know it comes off Europe or off of Africa, bends down, and then comes back up and forms like a little bit of a mushroom near the Caribbean. But what we've noticed is that the magnitude is low. So um, satellite AODs were showing, you know, approximately 1.7 to 2, you know, and, and above just off the coast of the Bahamas and near the Caribbean, and where our model was showing about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So we're under predicting the dust there, but we believe that this is due to uh, missing one of the sources. And we believe that it's the drag partition that's driving this. And so we actually think that it missed the dust source um, out of Southwestern Algeria that kind of pushed down through Mali and then out. And so, We've been working on updating the Fungsa dust emission scheme. And so we've, we actually have an experimental version that's using this albedo drag partition. And what we can see is that we're, we're capt much capturing a better spatial pattern um, compared to observations where it actually comes out over top of Cape Verde, where the um, old model actually showed the higher concentrations below Cape Verde. And then the other thing that we're seeing is we're seeing three, much three higher minutes, concentrations. Morning. We're seeing much higher concentrations over the Bahama. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, this is an event that actually impacted air quality in the United States, and it, it caused um, big events, as Jeff McQueen showed yesterday, where it actually created. Um, essentially toxic air or polluted air that was unsafe for humans. And so we need to, we really need to focus on improving this dust scheme. So just in summary, the FUNGSA dust emission scheme, you know, is, is implemented into the UFS and is being put as part of the operational guest aerosol. And it will also be part of um, the future CAM-CMAC system as well. 
Um, Fungsa is unique in the way that it sets its threshold values, um, making it you know, different than any other dust model that's out there. Um, the, uh, we're, we're able to capture you know, dust events in February and over um, the July period, but we've, we're, show, we're showing that you know, there's still room for improvement for the dust scheme and that um, you know, having a better description of the surface improves the dust emissions drastically. And that's all I got. Okay, well, thank you, Barry. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, Tracy, do we have questions? Yes, we have a couple questions. Um, first one from Arun Shawa. Is the dust emission scheme implemented independently in the CMAC and GSD CHEM models? And if yes, what is the process for keeping these models up to date with updates to the scheme? So currently in NAQFC and GEFS aerosols, they are maintained separately. But I be believe the plan is to have um, a single um, emission scheme, probably through CCPP, that you know would be able to provide the emissions for whatever application that you have. So FUNGSA in general does not produce size segregated results. It just produce it actually just predicts total mass. What it then does is then applies a size distribution scheme to it to be able to fit whatever model that it's needed. So the plan going forward is that we have a single code base that would house the the emission, the inline emission scheme. So for instance, sea salt, dust, um, plume rise, those kinds of things. Does that answer your question? We have a couple more questions. Thank you. Um, Derek Malia asked, I was trying to follow the logic of the friction velocity threshold. Has this been changed from previous versions of the Fengxia dust emission model? If I remember correctly, this was a function of soil type, land use type, soil moisture. Is this still the case? So, um, so yes, there. It, it's actually a, a function of um, essentially the ratio between the boundary layer U star and um, essentially what would be just above the surface. So th they call this the uh, the drag partition. So how does the boundary layer turbulence scale to you know the actual turbulence just above the soil, and then uh, a function of the soil moisture. But we we it's, we don't base it on land use type in Jeff's aerosol. We base it on soil type. And so um, what what Fungsa uses in the Jeff's aerosol is actually the um, the soil grids two fifty data set for soil types. And this was because if we used exactly what was in the um, the land surface model in GEFS aerosols, it did not provide enough detail to accurately predict dust emissions. And so we actually have to input a separate soil data set to be able to get a higher resolution data set. Okay, uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up just so we can have some time for a break. But I see that you already have the Slack on your screen, so you can uh, follow up with the other questions. Um, so everybody, we have a break now for a half an hour. Uh, we're going to reconvene at 12.30 Eastern for the data simulation ensembles and predictability plenary session, which we'll be using GoToWebinar. Are there other announcements from the other organizers? I'm sure, Lija, I'll just say that we're going to leave the webinar open so people can just um, stay on if they wish. And those who are presenting in the next session, um, if you want to arrive, you know, 15 minutes or so before the uh, the session starts, we can practice sharing your screen if you if you'd like that opportunity. Okay. Uh... 
Thank you, Kat. Thank you to all our speakers, and uh, we'll see you back shortly. Bye bye.
Steve, are you there? I saw you are looking to share your screen. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna hand the controls to you right now. All right, so I can see it, but I can also see um, all of your different, like the different slides. Can you put it in like a presentation mode? Steve, can you hear me now? There are no spawns from Steve. Hey, Catherine. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. Steve, are you trying to talk at all? Because we can't hear you if you are. Oh, yeah, he's not on mute actually. So it looks like he dropped off. So maybe See. he was having a technical. Okay, uh, let me check attendee list. Okay, let me put it panel list. Okay. Okay, Steve is back as the panelist. Yes, yes, I can so tell I, you. I yeah. Audio, so I, I exited and came back. Should I try again? Yeah. Okay, do you want me to share your screen again? Sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll go full screen. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, can you see my cursor? Mm. No, no, I didn't if see that. See it, uh, if I do. Okay. Yeah. At this. Oh, okay. I see that actually. You do? The cursor is moving. No, actually, cursor is still in play. Actually. Hmm. Um, and the slides don't appear to be in full screen. Yeah, it's still, yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. I saw they had this problem yesterday. Um, I don't know what to do. Um, 
Okay. Uh, Let me try if I share. I'm sharing keynote. Let me try sharing. Now I see it. No, it's yeah, yeah. No, it's a full right, screen, so and then I, your mouth is moving. The whole screen. I can't just do the app. And um, I can see your cursor now too. You can. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. I'm How good. did you fix it? You you had to. So it said sharing, and I shared just keynote my um my uh, application. But it asked to switch. I switched to main screen to share the whole screen, and that worked. All right, good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Ming, are we still missing one presenter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yue Jian, Zhu, and I'm looking, but uh, he's in, in attendees, but uh, he's not in the list yet. Okay. Yeah, he's not here. Yeah. Hey Ming, can you hear me? Yes. Hey VJ. You want to give the screen to me? Okay. Tessarin, can you give a screen to VJ? Uh yep. So sure. I actually VJ, thanks for covering Tom's talk. Are you going to give two part talk and uh, how, how are you going to uh, do this? Or, or go through the whole talk and then answer the questions. It's up to you actually. Yeah, I'll be combining both talks into one. Okay, so we basically uh, question and answer at the end of the whole talk. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, what are you seeing when I share the screen? I see your desktop, so the Slack, Slack channel's up. Oh, the Slack one. I need to bring the other screen. Yes, if you drag it over. Oh, okay. That's crazy. All right, let me try that. Catherine? Yes. Uh, we need to make an announcement that um, the link for the Earth System Modeling Parallel session is incorrect in the logistics email that we sent out, and so that users need to click on it uh, from the website. Are you aware of that? I just saw that come through. Yep. Okay. So, Ming, I don't know if you can yep. make an announcement. Yeah, I will let uh, Catherine make that announcement. Okay. At the end of this session, okay. Okay. Okay, great. Then can you see my presentation now? Yes. Yep, looks good. Okay, so that means uh, we are ready, right? <laughs> I think so. Okay, great. Uh, it's uh, 12 30 p.m. East time, and uh, it's let's start uh, with this uh, plenary session data simulation ensembles and uh, predictability. Our first uh, uh, speaker is VG Palaparagada. I hope I say that right. From NOAA EMC. 
and uh, his talk is TEFS V12 Operational Implementation, uh, implementation of UFS Subsidial Applications. His talk, this talk is combined with next talk, the reanalysis for the Global Ensemble Forecast System version 12. So VG, you have 30 minutes and I will give, uh, give a, a, a wrap up warning at uh, 27 minutes. Please go ahead. Perfect. Thank you, Meng. Uh, glad to have this opportunity to present uh, at the UFS Users Workshop. The title of my talk today is uh, uh, the operational implementation of the subseasonal forecast system, uh, also known as the Global Ensemble Forecast System, the GAFS version 12. And as Ming mentioned, I'll be also giving a talk on the reanalysis and reforecasts that were generated as part of uh, this GEPS V12 development, which is required for subseasonal weather forecast calibration and validation. And uh, as you can see, this talk is uh, a true uh, collaborative effort. I'll be presenting on behalf of several people who have put a lot of effort uh in making this happen and this is by far the biggest project i would say emc has uh handled in terms of both the extent of uh the implementation the scope of the implementation as well as the number of components that that are involved uh, in this uh development so uh, uh, as many of you know ncep operates many numerical models and uh, we are in the process of simplifying them uh, using the UFS framework. And this is one of the efforts where we will combine multiple modeling systems into one, uh, especially the global wave ensembles and the global aerosol component. The GWES and the NGAC is the NSEP global aerosol component. Uh, this is a collaborative effort. A lot of people are involved. Uh, NSEP EMC led the development of this modeling system for operational implementation in collaboration with our, uh, our stakeholders um, and the scientists at GSL, PSL, GFDL, ARL, NESDES, and a uh, lot of uh, uh, folks from the regional weather service forecast offices as well as NSEP centers. <clears throat> So uh, just to expand on that, uh, there are several teams that are working together. This is a, a multi-year project that we successfully led to completion. The ensemble project team, the wave project team, the aerosol project team, and the GFS project team at EMC in collaboration with the PSL reanalysis and reforecast project team, and the GSL aerosol chemistry group, ARL and NESDIS uh, for emission data sets, our own model evaluation group which has conducted extensive evaluation in coordination with the field and the stakeholders our engineering and implementation branch provided the support for the global workflow environmental equivalence standards resource optimization and the nco which is responsible for running it in operations in real time they are now carrying out the final steps uh, towards the implementation the program office uh, from OSTI, the CPC, uh, which has uh, contributed a lot in terms of evaluating our extended forecasts, the water center, which is using our reanalysis and reforecast data sets to calibrate the hydrological ensemble forecast system, and also all our stakeholders from centers and regions who have participated in evaluation of this ensemble uh, forecast performance. And obviously our management which has supported all uh, the pro project development as well as the production suite simplification so i'll be covering uh, uh, a major topics here what is uh, in the scope for the gaps v12 and how we evaluated them what are the benefits and some concerns and i'll conclude with some future plans so the proposed uh, version 12 configuration uh, this is a global ensemble forecast system. As many of you know, last year we implemented the first UFS medium range weather forecast system. The global forecast system went into operations in June 2019 uh, based on the FE3 dynamic core 
the same modeling system is now extended to the ensemble forecast system. The version 11 is currently in operations that's still using the global spectral model, the semi Lagrangian version of that, uh, with the GFS physics that is being now changed to the finite volume cube sphere dynamic core, along with uh, GFDL microphysics and the GFS physics. The initial perturbations for the ensemble system comes from the global data simulation system, the ENKF, uh, six hour forecast. The model uncertainty now includes newer stochastic parameterization schemes developed in collaboration with PSL, the SPPT, the stochastic physical perturbation tendencies, and also the SCAB, the stochastic kinetic energy backscatter. And the model is now uh, extended to forecast up to 35 days every day. And so we need to uh, deal with the uh, ocean conditions in terms of SSTs. Uh, initial plan was to couple it to the ocean model, but that was not ready. So we had to design an alternate strategy where we use the MSST, same as in the GFS, and also the two-tiered SST where the forecasted SSTs from CFS are relaxed uh, to observations in the GAPS forecast system. The tropical cyclone uh, treatment, there is no relocation, just like in the global deterministic model. We felt like it is no longer necessary. The horizontal resolution for the GAPS B12 has increased from about 34 kilometers in the current system to 25 kilometers, and it will stay 25 kilometers throughout the forecast length up to 35 days. The vertical resolution is same as the GFS, 64 levels. And it runs uh, four cycles a day, 16 days for three cycles. And at every zero Z, we provide 35 day forecasts. That is the sub-seasonal forecast range. The number of ensemble members in the system are increased from 20 to 30. And we also have one more member added to couple the aerosol model. So total 32 members. The output resolution will be increased to quarter degree. And uh, the first 10 days, every three hour output. And for the rest of the forecast length, six hourly. Uh, we did the reforecast for 30 years, actually 32 years, if you include 2019 and 2020. And the planned implementation date is September 14, 2020. <coughs> so to expand on, the reanalysis and reforecast. Uh, this is uh, to support the subseasonal weeks three and four forecasts. Uh, it's a requirement for providing the calibration uh, data sets, both for the reanalysis and reforecasts. Uh, we used uh, the same modeling system, but at a reduced resolution uh, for the reanalysis. And uh, for reforecast, we use the same modeling system, same resolution, uh, but with different initial conditions. Uh, for the first 11 years, we use the CFS analysis, and for the next of the 20 years, we use the reanalysis produced by PSL. I'll be talking about that uh, on behalf of Tom Hamill in the next few slides. Uh, the reanalysis and reforecast are not produced every day. Uh, as you can see in this uh, timeline chart here, every, every week uh, we have uh, one day with 11 members out to 35 days. And uh, for the rest of the weekdays, 16 days out to uh, for five members. And that's how every zero Z 20 year reforecasts were generated. The reanalysis itself is cycled for entire 20 years. And uh, we used uh, different phases here. The first phase will be CFSR uh, with the initial perturbations from reading vectors, the resolution similar to the gaps V10. And then the phase two is using the, the gap three analysis produced by PSL. Uh, there are a lot of data that's produced in this and they're made available uh, in different formats, different resolutions. I'll have a slide to describe that as well. So uh, UFS uh, must contain the reanalysis and reforecasting as part of the integrated forecast system. So the ensemble prediction system provides the real-time ensemble predictions the reforecast data from the ensemble uh, predictions from the past uh, combined with the observations or reanalysis that are used to train the post-processing uh, predictors and, uh, and apply the post-processing methods to provide 
probabilistic guidance using sophisticated post-process techniques. So the reforecast and reanalysis is a critical component of this prediction system. Uh, the one big change in terms of how this reanalysis was created uh, uh, was not to just mimic the observations, but to initialize the reforecasts. So uh, it is important to understand the difference here. Uh, this reanalysis should be as consistent and as practical as the operational analysis system using the GAPS V12. So the consistency uh, supersedes the absolute accuracy and bias. Unlike uh, other centers like the European Center where the reanalysis data is used for model verification, climate variability analysis and other applications, uh, if that is the purpose of uh, uh, having this data, I think we better uh, use ERA5 or MERA type reanalysis. But for initializing the model, the reanalysis is used here for the GAPS V12. Uh, in the future, we probably will approach a different strategy uh, where the UFS systematic errors uh, uh, are continuously decreasing and better coupling of analysis between various uh, system components so that one reanalysis can serve multiple purposes. Uh, so just to uh, illustrate the differences between the current reanalysis that's used in, in production, that's the CFS, um, CFSR analysis, compared to the GAPS V12, uh, the CFSR analysis is running continuously since 1978 uh, with the same frozen model uh, in, 2000, in, in around 2000, I believe, and then the GAPS V12 uh, replaced uh, that model with the FE3 based GFS and the reanalysis and reforecast were generated for 20 years. So, all the differences here uh, are just to show how much advancements have been made uh, uh, since the CFSR analysis was created. Uh, the ensemble stochastic physics, especially, are uh, coming from the SPPT and the SCAB and also the stochastic humidity perturbations. And in the reanalysis, we use 80 member ENKF at around 75 kilometers, C128 resolution uh, using a hybrid EMR uh, technique along with IAU. The SST is uh, from the uh, Reynolds SSTs. Uh, there is no coupling in the cycle DA, and also there is no full ocean analysis. Uh, the tropical cyclones are directly assimilated using the central pressure, no relocation in the reanalysis as well. Uh, just to illustrate some highlights uh, of all the 20-year reanalysis, the reanalysis has uh, nicely captured uh, the larger climatic signals like the QBO. Uh, as you can see here, the Passa Vianal oscillation is well captured in, in this reanalysis, both from the sea level pressure as well as uh, uh, from the pressure field as well as from the wind field. Uh, in terms of the short-term forecast using the reanalysis as a measure for improvement, uh, either coming from the analysis or from the model, what you're seeing here is various streams that are run under this reanalysis and the short-range forecast, five-day forecasts, and comparing with the CFSR and the sign color with the red dashed lines uh, coming from the gaps V12, you can see the anomaly correlation has significantly improved uh, in all global regions, especially in the tropics, and also uh, in various vertical levels. So this is uh, an illustration of uh, improved uh, forecast skill coming from the use of the reanalysis. So how this data is being shared, uh, both the reanalysis and reforecast data is uh, shared through Amazon Web Services Cloud, and also internal NOAA FTP servers. Under the Big Data Project, about 200 forecast fields are being stored and the links provided here uh, can take you to the distribution of the data that was provided courtesy of the Big Data Project and Amazon Web Services. We also have the reforecast data stored on uh, our own on disk attached to RZDM. Uh, it is uh, going to be also made publicly available. The GAPS also combines uh, two major components uh, in terms of uh, coupling the earth system components. The first one is the waves. Uh, operationally, we have a global wave ensemble system that was uh, initialized in 2004 and had go gone through several upgrades since then. And uh, this time, instead of having a 
standalone application for the global ensembles, uh, the wave ensembles are now combined with the GEFSV12. Uh, it is the first global scale UFS coupled system, uh, even though it's only a one way coupled uh, uh, setup, there is no feedback from waves to the atmosphere. Uh, it is uh, being under development right now under the coupled model development for the sub seasonal and seasonal scales. But as an initial effort, uh, we are integrating the framework of the wave ensembles with the atmospheric ensembles. It comes with uh, improved source terms for the physics and also objective optimization with hourly surface wind forcing uh, from the GFS. We also have uh, several new products coming with the global wave ensemble merger with the GFSP12. The next component that was added to the atmospheric model is the aerosol component. Uh, this is run as a single additional member uh, for aerosols. It's now called GAPS aerosol. It replaces the operational NGAC, the NAMS global aerosol component. It uses the same meteorology as in the GFS. Uh, inline aerosol representation is developed by GSD Chem. You already heard from various speakers on that. Uh, Lee Jang and Barry Baker and Ivanka and Jeff have described this. The um, Components, uh, the aerosol components include the sulfates, organic carbon, black carbon, the dust, sea salt. It uses the latest emissions from the CEDS and the GBBPX, Feng Sha dust, uh, GOS5 sea salt, and the marine DMS. The smoke plume rise uh, is wind shear dependent 1D cloud model, and the tracer transport is a uh, part of the convection scheme in uh, GFS physics. The fluxes are calculated positive, definitive with the uh, appropriate scavenging coefficient for all uh, aerosol species. So I'll shift focus to how we evaluated the gaps V12 from the atmospheric component first, followed by waves and aerosols. So this is a, a, a result of about two and a half years worth of reforecasts that were done with the same configuration that's going to be used in the operational uh, implementation when it goes live in September. So what you're seeing here is the comparison of the GAPS V12 with the current production version, the GAPS V11. Uh, this is the, the CRPS scale, the continuous rank probabilistic score, uh, uh, equal to 0.25 is similar to about anomaly correlation of 0.6 or the useful forecast length. And what you can see here is with the GAPS V12, we are extending the useful forecast skill by about half a day, uh, typically, the improvements are about one day per decade based on the past experience. So we are getting about uh, half a day of improvement with just one implementation. It's uh, observed in both global uh, hemispheres, both northern hemisphere as well as in the southern hemisphere. In terms of wind speeds, again, the similar improvements, about half a day improvement of uh, general wind speeds at 850 in the northern hemisphere and about 0.6 days at the higher level, 250 millibar in the northern hemisphere. Precipitation improvements are one of the biggest uh, attractions from this implementation. What you're seeing here is the ensemble precipitation verification for the corners uh, for different thresholds. This is the one, milli one millimeter per day threshold. This is five millimeter and this is 20 millimeter. And in all uh, these uh, different thresholds, the scale is extended by more than a day uh, in terms of how much use, useful skill is there from the ensemble system. Uh, the reliability of the forecast of presentation is also uh, pretty impressive here. The, the diagonal line is the perfect reliable score, and the red line from the GAPS V12 is much closer to the diagonal compared to the current operational system. Tropical cyclone Verification also showed significant improvements. The track forecasts have improved both in the Atlantic and the Western Pacific, somewhat neutral in the Eastern Pacific. The biggest improvements are from the intensity forecasts. Uh, there is more than 50% improvement from uh, the ensemble mean of the GAPS V12 compared to uh, the production version of the GAPS V11. In all basins, the improvement in the intensity forecast is pretty dramatic. There is also a very nice uh, improvement in the spread. The ensemble dispersion is much better in the FSV12 compared to the FSV11. 
Uh, moving on to extended forecast lens, the week two, week three, and four, uh, these evaluations are done by CPC. And what you can see here compared to other operational tools that CPC uses, the GEFS V12 has significantly added a scale, about three points in the anomaly correlation uh, for 500 millibar geopotential heights in the northern hemisphere. And also for weeks three and four, it added about two points in uh, weeks three and four. Uh, in terms of uh, temperature and precipitation over the corners, uh, the height key skill score is used here uh, for weeks week two and weeks three and four. The GAFS V12 height key skill score is uh, higher in about eight of 12 months compared to the GAFS V10. Uh, summertime improvements are uh, pretty significant here. 95% significant level, uh, it, it is improved. In terms of precipitation, uh, the skill is also better from GAFS V12, eight out of 12 months. Overall, the skill is higher than the GAFS V10 that's currently used, but only about 87% uh, significance, uh, except in January where the import improvements are pretty substantial. MJO, another metric for looking at the subseasonal predictions. Uh, the GAFS V12 is compared against the CFS V2 for the first 10 years, uh, first 11 years, and then uh, with a subseasonal version of the, the GAFS uh, sub X for the, for the latest 2000 to 2016. Uh, the first 11 years, it showed about two days improvement uh, in the MJO skill uh, from about 19 days to 21 days. And uh, in the modern era, uh, based on the 19 year climatology, the MJO skill has extended uh, again by about two days from 21 to 23 days. This is uh, again, substantial improvement, uh, quite significant for subseasonal forecasts. Uh, the wave evaluation is done similarly using a one year retrospective forecast uh, from December 1st, 2018 through November 30th, 2019. The RMAC, the BIAS and the CRPS and the 95th quantile for the significant wave heights. And you can see the RMSE has substantially reduced compared to both the deterministic wave model and the current operational global wave ensemble system. Both the bias and the RMSE have significantly reduced uh, uh, and uh, consistently both in the short as well as in the long range forecasts. The CRPS scores also have, have improved along with the 95th quantile. The storm waves better predicted through, through the year in short as well as the long forecast ranges. The aerosol evaluation, this is the comparison, this is the correlation of uh, the day one forecast of the AOD, the aerosol optical depth, compared with the aeronet observations. And uh, this is the correlation of uh, the forecast with the observations. You can see the low, lower correlation for various aeronet sites, uh, the blues and the purples here, are now into oranges and greens and yellows. Uh, significant improvement in aerosol forecasts uh, for entire global region. The model evaluation group from EMC has done extensive evaluation and they have uh, summarized the common positive themes from the evaluation here. Higher 500 hectopascal anomaly correlation, improved synoptic predictability, increased ensemble spread, and improved dispersion. The spread is located in meaningful areas so that it is more usable. Improved TC tracks, spread, and location of precipitation maximum, better handling of uh, extratropical cyclones, more reliable precip forecasts, improved representation of weather near topography, uh, mitigation of exaggerated offshore QPF maxima. These are uh, the common positive themes. And uh, our uh, scientific operation offices from various regions, they have evaluated the usefulness of GAPS B12 subjectively. And uh, based on all the evaluation, there is a, a unanimous consensus opinion that the GAFS V12 uh, is rated as good or better than V11 by more than 70, 80%, including the short range, compared to about five to 20%, 30% um, for the current operational system. So that's about 50% more utility across all forecast lengths. So the summary of all the evaluation that was conducted, um, GAPS V12 is much improved from GAPS V11, the global wave ensemble system, and the NSEP global aerosol component. Uh, 
The sub-seasonal forecasts especially have demonstrated an improvement by two to three days. Much better scores for both the Pacific North American region as well as the Northern Hemisphere. The wave heights significantly reduced errors and biases. The GAFs 10-day uh, forecasts are now equivalent to the current scale of five-day forecast for the waves. Uh, similarly, significant improvement in AOD forecast from GAFs V12 in all global regions. There are also some concerns that were identified based on the evaluation. The temperature bias, just like in the global deterministic model, the low-level cold bias, uh, although surface is overall exempt, uh, uh, the reforecasts uh, must be used to reduce the bias and advance the skill through bias correction and calibration, because the model inherited the same biases from the GFS V15. Similar to GFS V15, we also see synaptic systems, especially upper level troughs, considerably too progressive. Uh, it is a challenging issue related to both dynamics and physics. Intensity and position of uh, heavy precipitation also could be a challenging issue related to dynamics and physics. The cross track bias for hurricane tracks at longer lead times also are not as good as we expected. The instability in the boundary layer. We still need a lot of improvements in the PBL. Extreme weather, uh, the ensemble spread is better. Uh, however, we need to improve the, to represent the tail of distributions. The MJO, uh, the propagation is good, but the amplitude still is weaker compared to the observations. The aerosols may have made things worse for spring biomass burning, maybe due to the COVID-19 situation or something else that we need to continue looking into. Uh, in terms of the reanalysis, uh, we expect to remain consistent with the major system changes. There are statistical characteristics that are likely significantly increased with uh, coupling. The GAFS V12 currently is uncoupled, but V13, the next version, is going to be at least weakly coupled coupled with a MOM6 ocean model and the size 6 uh, ice model. Atmosphere to use ocean forecast background in the data simulation, and ocean will use the atmospheric forecast background. The GAFS V14 will definitely be going to be strongly coupled by the time we reach there. A challenge with this reanalysis is the sequencing of production with the operational upgrade cycle. This whole project that I just described is about three years. The length of that project period is mainly because of the reanalysis production, which takes a lot of time and it has to be sequentially done until the reforecast can be generated. There is a potential to use the cloud resources uh, with a search computing where we can do a reanalysis, scout runs, and the production much faster using a search compute available on, on, on the cloud and that can definitely reduce the length of uh, production and we can focus more on the scientific developments and improvements to the system. So that's something that we need to uh, factor in as we make progress towards the next version. So the future plans, the GAFS V12 is going in quarter four this year. The next version will be not until quarter 224, but it will be merging both the deterministic and ensemble systems into one big system and also absorb multiple ensemble systems and uh, global components as the UFS medium range and sub-seasonal forecast system. So that's what uh, we will be focusing on uh, in the next few years. And there is a big component of it supported by the UFS R2O project that we will be discussing later this week. So thank you for your attention and I'll be glad to take any questions. Great, thank you, Vijay. And uh, we do have questions, right, Catherine? We do, yep. Um, so the first one is from um, Jim Kinder, and he's asking, is there a cost to users to access or download reanalysis, reforecast data from AWS? Absolutely none. It's freely available, and the links that I provided in this presentation uh, are directly accessible to anybody in the public. Excellent. Uh, the next one is from Stelios. Is the Wave RR available too? Uh, not in this version. We have not done any reanalysis for the waves 
but for the next version, since it will be going to be a, at least a weekly coupled system, it will include the wavering analysis as well. And then um, one more. So there's one from Lisa Bernadette. Um, have any hypotheses been raised regarding the synoptic patterns being too progressive in GFS, GEFS? So there is some investigation that's going on. We are looking at the GFS V16 that's currently undergoing um, testing and evaluation. There are some indications that we made some improvements, but we don't yet know the root cause of uh, the progressive motion, especially at the longer lead times. So that's a, that's a science challenge that, that remains uh, a high priority for UFS to address. All right, and then it looks like Weiwei Lee also has a, a shout out for a presentation tomorrow um, that may be related. Okay, uh, great. Thanks for good questions and answers and uh, this great talk. Thank you, VG. And uh, we better to move on. And our next uh, uh, presenter will be uh, Yue Jian Zhu and uh, from, he's from EMC too. So his topic is the challenges of the NCEP Global Ensemble Forecast System Development. And uh, this talk has uh, 15 minutes and uh, I will give a wrap up warning at uh, 13 minutes. Uh, Yue Jian, uh, please go ahead when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, uh, yes, I do see your screen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is the full screen, right? Yes. Okay, let me see. Why? Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. It looks good, it's moving. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, 15 minutes, yeah, in front of uh, the video talk. Uh, I can skip some of them just to give you the some challenges when the past few years we are developed global ensemble systems. And also this is uh, the, the, you know, contributed by many people over here and uh, try to just share with the people's audience around the community. And uh, we're talking about ensembles. I'll give you the quick background of the description of ensemble forecast system. Mainly, we deal have two uncertainty. One is the initial uncertainty, one is the model uncertainty. Okay. At the beginning of the ensembles, we only introduce the initial uncertainty, uh, assume our model is perfect. But later on, the, both the European models and uh, our models introduce the stochastic physics or model uncertainty to the system. And uh, here is a reference from Laboto, the European Centers review our global ensemble system and the Europeans and the Canadian. Canadian is a different story, it's a multi-model ensemble, the multi-physics, okay. And uh, so the point over here, I'm talking about uh, the two uncertainties, the one initial uncertainty, one is the model uncertainty. We, have, we do have some challenges, okay. The, the this is the, the schematic diagram of ensembles. You give the initial uncertainty, the, for example, here, and uh, we are using ENCAF. The video already showed that one. And uh, we also introduced the stochastic the physics. So that at any time, T plus one or T plus two, you will see that we have an ensemble cloud, okay? This is uh, the, the, the spread when we saw the T plus one, T plus two is present to the future, the uncertainty we are talking about, okay? So this is schedule like, like I mean, if we give you the one real case, like the, this cross section, you can, you can see the, the perturbations that have a larger and at the middle latitude and the smaller and the tropical, and that is the most typical case, yeah. And uh, we are, uh, have some challenges. I most of them I don't have answers. I just show the papers and the community. You uh, may have a question as well, but uh, just share with you. Okay, I'm talking about science challenge. Is mainly the initial uncertainty and the modern uncertainty and others we call interaction of uncertainties. 
and also the technical challenges about the, the some video already mentioned, some not. I can tell you a little bit about that one. And the uh, initial uncertainty, okay, that I, I put a question over there. Do we really know the true initial uncertainty? I don't have an answer, okay. I just show you a few examples. The, the plot, top, Three plot is the northern hemisphere, sometimes the tropical, the initial the uncertainty or spread, the vertical profile. Okay. The black line over here, that is the breeding vector we are using the many years ago. Okay. It's operational. We still have that one, it's a legacy system, but not the kind of version 11. Uh, and the color line that represents the EN cap, that's first generation of EN cap. It's a, I'm, I'm going to give you a background that many the upgrade of the EN curve system is the fourth, fifth, or sixth generation anyway. But this, the first time you saw that one, you 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 can believe both represent the, the initial the perturbations, but the big difference, okay. The in terms of this, this is a one year average, okay. And after a couple of generations, bottom the third generation, that time the the e, the breeding vector still running. The EN curve get upgrade. That's important. You see the black line is still the operational for breeding vector, but EN curve make big changes. Looks very close to the what is the breeding vector. You know, I mean, I don't know which one you to choose, but I tell you, the from a first generation to third generation is a big difference over there, right? Uh, I think you saw that one. The this is, is a choose, particular for northern hemisphere. You see the the percentage maybe maybe a little bit strong, but the, the profiles the structure is pretty similar. Okay. Then then you come to the most related one. You know, is a I don't I don't remember the which version, but the the, the current operational is a sixty four lovers EN care. We come to next one GFS version sixteen. The, Convert to 127 levels. Okay, there are also some changes. The ENKF changes. Okay, the localized the ENKF and the stochastic and others you know, changes. But you will see the black one is a come from operational current today, and the, the green and the yellow one, both of them is analysis and the six hour forecast. It's a very similar. The six hour forecast a little bit larger than. But you look, folks, on the northern hemisphere, you will see this is the one case, okay. But based on my experience, the one case is enough to see the difference. You will see the the next version, where like like you know from a top, the left plot, you will see like the twenty to thirty or forty percent increase the spread for the whole vertical, okay. And the top right, you will see the I also brought the the one closed is a zonal average or closed the, you know from south south hemisphere to northern hemisphere. You will see it over here and a green line and a yellow line. Particular like you, you will see the middle latitude. It's some some way is nearly double the perturbation. Okay, the the so that is a big difference. I don't know the, if you saw this one. You will see the we know. What is the uh, initial uncertainty? Okay, it's, it's a puzzle to me. I just let you know that one. Uh, yeah, anyway, we try to get better and better. That is our goal. Yeah, I know that, I understand that too. And uh, of course, if the change the perturbation, the property changes scale, like the over dispersion and others. I'm talking about next one. It's more talking about the model uncertainty. If you see over here, I give you examples. Is a, is model A, B, C. That's true. I didn't put a, the, any models. The presentation case one on left and the case two on right. You will see each model gave a different uh, answer for the heavy presentation. That right one is a snowstorm in New York that a couple of years years ago is very the you know the argument the, the cases. Okay, I'm talking about circle in the middle of the United States for the left one. All the models. Sure, the result is different. Right? Model A give the very you know extreme the events over there. Model B and the C, the C have some probability of that, but model B is uh, almost lost that one. But the the southwest, southeast, the ocean coast, that one is more confirmed. Okay, 
And uh, the another case is the original model ABC. You see that each model have a uh, all different answer. I don't know from the top to right, that is a really uncertainty. You look at that one, it's three models. You know, I give some some the comments over there, but I don't think so the give a good examination of that one. But the for left one, the eventually you see that one is a is a severe storm, that, you know. Is a very strong the precipitation in the middle part of that one. That model A is is, is great. I'm just show you example of the is large uncertainty. And uh, right now we are introduced. The many people talking about the VG also showed that when we stock, they introduced the five skill stochastics over there, and we much improve our, our the the uncertainty for cut from top to the bottom. You see the color is light. That is much better than before. Okay, the stochastics and uh, I'm going to show you one example of so 35 days, looming square arrow in the sort line and the dash line is spread. Usually, the, you have spread is much close to the looming square arrows. And uh, the F3 GFS 1 is a rare one. We tune in pretty well to match up that one. I'm telling you, the stochastic mainly is a, is a tune process. Okay, tune that one. And another the puzzle over here, I, I don't know how many of you see that one. It's a, is, is kind of the the plot is very popular in the past few years talking about S2S, you know, what is the source of predictability? Then for sure then from most of the source from the atmospheric initial conditions and for the particular we talk about S2S, land contribute a lot. Okay. I don't know you agree or not. Anyway, this is a very popular the the plot provided by the Paul the, the Meyer, you know. Uh, I have a um, the difficulty to understand some of them. I show you example over here. For example, land over here, okay? The left is a model low level. The right part is the top of the soil, the part. We are perturbed the soil 20 times. Sensitivity test for a week to see what is the atmosphere response to this one. The temperature, the difference showed the bottom, you will see the light difference for land soil. But the model response is much less, much less. Okay, not respond to that one. I don't know how to that transform. The even you have a larger perturbation for soil, but the atmosphere how to response. This is uh, is challenging to us. Okay, and uh, talking about a couple of the technique, the the challenges. Okay, one one is a uh, we are in the in the past. Global system have two global system. One is the global ensemble. One is the global the deterministic. Global ensemble use the deterministic, but however, the two system not implement the same time. The ensemble use the deterministic the models. However, the model kept changing. I give you example. Last version eleven implement December fifteen. Sooner or later the GFS upgrade. Latest upgrade is last year, June, not, not May. Okay, sorry, but June not 2019, the FW3 for 15. Okay, that means the, the inconsistent. When we when we run in the version 12 tuning the initial perturbation and the model uncertainty, come to these changes is a model inconsistent with the ensembles and the deterministic and the initial condition is inconsistent. Okay. And uh, our the version 12, the video just present, we present next the September, the the for the FV3, that is the version 15 physics. However, the several months later, February 2021, 16 will come in line. That different the, the modified model physics, particular, the model have a 127 love instead of 64 love. That is a challenge, okay. And the realized re forecast. This time we have, and uh, the when we run them to come to the operational, the next year that's the 16. The model changed and the initial the analysis changed. Okay, so this is the way impact for our last implementation. The when the F3 come in line, and uh, we we have seen over here this top is the. Here the, is a looming square of the operational and the version 12, 11 and 12. Okay, rarely is the, the version 12. We have reduced the looming square arrows from uh, 11. And the bottom line is the ratio, the spread and the error ratio. One is a perfect, okay? 
you see that we don't see the big changes. The red is more close to the one better than black. However, you see the big jump the, since the June or last year. Anyway, the black is much under dispersion. That is kind of inconsistent. We are moved to the F3 GFS, but ensemble we are not changed. The operation we don't allow us to make change. Okay, anyway, this kind of problem over here. See what is the difference? The initial perturbation of, see over here, this is a snapshot of the temperature spread profile. The black one is operational, red one is, is a 15. We move to the, in, at this time, make the changes. You know, the initial spread is different. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you have two minutes left. Please. Yeah, they're almost done. Okay. Why do I need a unification? Like this workshop, you know, is UFS unification. Okay, unification unification is is great. You know, we need to to unify our system, not only model, the workflow and our implementation and others. Yeah, of of course, we face challenges, particularly the resource for implementation, like the GFS GFS coming line in the same implementation, the resource. I'm talking about the, the like the realness reforecast retrospective and the two jumbo system will run together, you know. So anyway, the we are everybody here will face the challenges. So that is the next one, GFS version 6, 17, and the GFS version 13 will unify by the, the Q2 of 2024. And also the ensemble version 6. 13 will include LNS and a real forecast, which you already mentioned. Yeah, I think the, the, what we try to do, you know, the, the more for future, I'm, what I'm thinking about, continue to improve the current SPs, stochastic basic perturbations, continue investigation, investigation of the process level uncertainty and the chain one bulb, the present the pretty the theoretic this morning and some of the practical practice, you know, dynamic uncertainty. We are never touched that point. The I I don't know. I do learning last year when we are the year two years ago when we changed one dynamic parameter like H hold from a six to five, the big difference from ensembles. And the initial uncertainty of a land ocean and the modern of land ocean were coming on. And the forecast uncertainty of interface between the land and the atmosphere and the ocean and the atmosphere. We need to understand. I will stop over here. Thank you for your attention and the time for question. Okay, thank you, Eugene. And uh, we, we can have uh, a quick question. Do we have questions from Slack? Oh, one thing just came through. So Yan Chu is asking, why did the RMSC spread change in GEFS version 11? when the GFS was updated. See here, initial perturbation change, not the same as before. So I think that the Ian point over here, right? Is the ratio, the here is the ratio. Is the lumen square error, lumen square improve, of course, a new system reduce the lumen square error, adding a product the spread over here. Here is the ratio. That means the, the spread gets smaller because your initial perturbation gets smaller. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Yujia. <laughs> so uh, we, 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 we better move on. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Steve uh, Penny from uh, NOAA PSL. And uh, his topic is the advancements toward a uh, data driving 4D war for ocean and uh, coupled data simulation. Uh, you have 15 minutes, Steve, and I will give you a wrap up warning at 13 minutes. Thank you, and please go ahead. All right, thanks. All right, so I'm going to talk about work we've been doing and advancing uh, capabilities in order to do general 40 VAR for the ocean and uh, for coupled data assimilation. We have a lot of, a lot of collaborators here. Um, some are funded and supported by uh, NOP proposal and our collaborators from UCSD and uh, NOAA, NRL, and UMD. And we have a couple new hires, Shen Yi Lin at NOAA PSL, who started on July 1st, Michael Goodliffe, who started on 
June 16th, and Matt Watwood, who's working with us as part of the NOAA Pathways Program. So overall, the goals that we have here are we want to develop data-driven methods. So that means whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, or statistical methods, all these are in the toolbox in order to accelerate components of the data assimilation cycle, which is what we're focusing on. We'd like to enable low cost implementations of these state-of-the-art data simulation methods and have the flexibility to apply them to any dynamical systems model, whether it be atmosphere, ocean, or coupled. Um, we want these methods to be scalable. So that means uh, we're specifically testing and developing at multiple resolution models, multiple complexity models, but our goal is to be able to rapidly transfer them to application to the UFS so we're looking at a direct path from research to operations. And we'd like to reduce the computational burden. One of the major bottlenecks for testing data assimilation is the cost of the forecast model. So that's a key element that we'd like to um, find an alternative low cost application that we can use to do coupled data simulation research and development. So my talk is gonna point a little bit to reservoir computing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about varieties of dynamic mode decomposition as another tool uh, and neural network and statistically derived tangent linear models that can be used in 40 var. And then a little bit towards where we're going with multi-scale dynamics and transferring these to more realistic systems. So first reservoir computing. Reservoir computing is a simplification of a recurrent neural network, which takes time into account in the neural network design. Uh, it's been pointed out by a number of authors that 40 var and the recurrent neural network share a lot of similarities. I think what you basic, what you need to know about this is that you're essentially starting with a simplified nonlinear system. In this case, on the top right, it's just a function of a hyperbolic tangent and a, a linear system, which is represented by A. Uh, instead of training these terms, we set them all in advance. So the only term that is learned from this process is the in blue, W out. Um, this output matrix is solved in a reg uh, regularized least squares. And in the end of this process, we basically can substitute this in, replace here U, what is the data, what is used to force this system towards a particular trajectory. Uh, once it's learned and substituted back in, we now have an, uh, a self-contained dynamical system that matches closely with the data. So as an example, the first thing we tried uh, that I'm gonna show you here is looking at a numerical model. You can think of this spin-up period here as if you were doing data assimilation. So there's noisy data and we're synchronizing the model um, to the data. And here I'm gonna just after running a number of independent ensemble members, run a ensemble forecast. So we no longer link to data and just let a free forecast run. And on the right here, we have the error covariance matrix representation. So you can see that with the reservoir computing model, we do the same process. We spin up with noisy data. Here, in this case, actually, these are identical initial conditions for the ensemble of perturbations and we run forward and you can see that after one model time step, which is um, about this amount of time out to 100 almost, um, by running this, uh, an ensemble of these reservoir computing trained models, uh, we are able to get an error covariance structure that looks nearly identical to the numerical model for ensemble. Um, and you'll note that in this case, the at the longer time range, the ensemble spread is much larger, but we're mostly concerned about the time scale where we can do a cycle of data assimilation. So that's in the shorter, shorter period. Uh, next, I want to show you a little bit about dynamic mode decomposition, which is an alternative uh, type of data-driven method. Uh, here, we're basically just looking at consecutive snapshots. Uh, in this case, for example, X would be the set of all time steps uh, with each. Uh, Xi being a column vector, and Y would be the set, again, the set of all time steps shifted by one. So we're essentially, we wanna assume a linear model and um, represent the transfer from X to Y. 
And by solving for that, we have some representation in a linear model of this transfer from X to Y. The key point here is that uh, dynamic mode decomposition isolates the large scale predictable oscillatory modes. So that's what we're focusing on for prediction. Uh, this basic form is equivalent to the linear inverse model of Penland and Sardishmuk, and that is being used, from what I understand, at CPC for prediction now. Um, the limb, uh, the basic dynamic mode decomposition has shown skill, for example, in weeks four or five of, of forecast of SST compared to ECMWF, and shown below for the six month tropical Pacific sea surface temperature anomaly compared to the NMME mean. So you can see here that um, this limb has reasonable skill in comparison to the uh, NMME, but uh, the key point I have here is that the cost of producing the NMME is many, many orders of magnitude more than the cost of producing the limb. So the, the idea here is that we can utilize the advantage that the limb have, has or the limb type model has which is speed and low cost, and try to take this further and do more with it. So what is the limb doing? Um, so the, the basic limb is a simple linear propagator. So you might think, what can this do that a complex uh, nonlinear numerical model cannot do? Basically, the most that a linear model can have in terms of representation is oscillation, exponential decay, and exponential growth. So what you see in this particular example is applied to the simple model, the Lorenz 96 model, we have oscillatory modes that gradually decay over time and they sort of fit the patterns in the early time periods. Now this isn't the best model to apply the limb to because there are no large scale oscillations that can be pulled out from the system. But there are advancements and developments to the dynamic mode decomposition, for example, the uh, time, you can include time delays, which gives you the HDMD uh, based on the Henkel matrix, which has a time delay in it. Uh, and you could also include nonlinear forcing terms as part of a, uh, what they call DMD with control. Uh, and both of these methods embed nonlinearity in the linear functional form. So you can see by going to higher dimensions, you can represent with much more accuracy the more intricate oscillations of the system again, using just this linear model, uh, but in higher dimensions. Um, so we can also look at how this performs in terms of generating error covariant structure. Uh, here again is the numerical model using identical perturbations that the next example will show. Um, and by transferring to the HDMD method, we see that we do get uh, not quite as uh, good agreement, but similar structure as the numerical model, not quite as good as compared to the reservoir computing. Um, but interestingly, uh, we have at longer time scales where the reservoir computing produced much wilder oscillations and large ensemble spread. The uh, HDMD has a very tight ensemble spread around the true state going forward for many, many time steps. Um, so we these are features of these methods and we're still working on figuring out the best way to utilize them and combine them to get um, all the, the uh, characteristics that we'd like to get out of these types of methods. Um, neural networks, we're looking at different ways to um, incorporate, uh, incorporate uh, the Jacobian or estimate the Jacobian here. We're using neural networks and basing them on the reservoir computing as forecast as the base state. Uh, here's another example where we're considering a statistical tangent linear model. Essentially, you could think of this as a linear regression through a cloud of points in the phase space from one time to the next. That gives us another time dependent representation of the linearization. Uh, and here we show by applying it with 40 var, we're able to get pretty close agreement in terms of the magnitude of the error between using the analytic TLM in 40 var or the um, ensemble based TLM. Um, and as we go forward, we, we're looking at a couple of different ways to expand this to more complex models. Here's a simple quasi geostrophic atmosphere ocean coupled model. It was based on dynamics by Charney and Strauss, uh, by that itself based on a proposal by Lorenz, um, and adds a QG model from Pierini. 
uh, and this and de Cruz et al have worked to support this um, development of this model um, and have made it available. So this is what we've been working with um, as an intermediate model for doing couple DA experiments. Here's an example uh, where we have applied couple DA with many different um, data assimilation methods to this coupled model. Um, and you can see that because the 4D var and uh, the 3D var use um, static error covariance estimates in this in the way we applied it here, uh, there's some degradation to the atmospheric uh, skill in the 4D var. In general, uh, if you observe all fields, it is um, basically comparable to the uh, ensemble common filter. Um, but we show here we're observing only the atmosphere. So there, there is a wild oscillations, a decadal oscillation in the ocean for the variational methods. Uh, and so this points to the fact that we need dynamically estimated error covariance no matter what method we use. We need to make sure the error covariance is estimated dynamically. Um, there's an interesting paper here that I recommend people look at. Uh, I don't have enough time to go through the details of it, but the key point here is that um, they find that it's important to constrain the slow and decaying modes in order to get accurate long-term prediction. And this says that um, basically these slow modes come from the uh, ocean. And so without having the ocean constrained correctly, uh, just constraining the fastest growing errors, which is what you capture with say an ensemble common filter error covariance estimate um, from the atmosphere, it's not enough to constrain the coupled system. Uh, this green line goes off the chart, which is just constraining basically the unstable atmospheric modes. Uh, and this is a skill score, which lower is better. So that means that um, very interestingly, the, uh, the more stable modes are necessary to constrain the forecasts. Uh, this is atmospheric uh, stream function and temperature. Uh, so we're looking at this model and trying to develop um, the time series analysis on the left is atmosphere over many, many um, uh, decade cycles of this model and the ocean. And these bursts occur in synchronization with the ocean. So it's a challenge here going to a very disparate system where we have different time scales and um, different uh, types of oscillatory dynamics. So uh, we're, we're now transitioning to this uh, this model to test some of these multi-scale challenges. Um, here is an example of applying the reservoir computing to the atmosphere. We have some agreement in some of the modes um, in this time scale that we're looking at for DA, but some of them have oscillations that really don't fit. Uh, same with the ocean. We, here's an example of applying dynamic mode decomposition, and we have um, nice fit to the uh, trajectory of some of these modes, but um, some just uh, don't track the system. So this is what we're developing next and we're putting time and effort into this. Uh, and finally, uh, some more realistic systems. Um, here- two minutes it, left. All right, thanks. Uh, here we're looking at the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and just to skip through this, we've tried a convolutional neural network. We tried a UNET. Um, these just do not or have not, even though they produce realistic uh, looking estimates. They do not produce the time evolution that we were looking for uh, in terms of accuracy to get error covariance statistics. So here's where we're applying the reservoir computing um, to a the front in the Gulf of Mexico loop current, a training on a patch of data. And so far we're able to produce a realistic uh, uh, increase in temperature here for the shifting loop current. Um, but we're just getting started with this to take this further. Um, in order to transition to more the, to realistic systems, we're incorporating this into JEDI. Here's the MALM being adapted for JEDI. Um, and going forward, the scaling is the most important um, priority item for us to be able to show we can transition this rapidly from simple to complex models like the UFS. Um, where we'll be implementing data assimilation with these methods uh, to demonstrate proof of concept with them. Um, we are working to transition these into JEDI first with MALM, uh, and then so we can rapidly transition and apply them to the low res UFS and the GEFS at the target resolution. 
And that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And uh, we have questions. Uh, yep, we have a question from Xu Wang Wang. Um, so would reservoir computing return reliable cross-variable covariance and cross-scale covariance? Um, I think it can. Um, this is what we're testing with the MALA model. That's a simple case where we have two very different scales. Um, but we were just getting started at that. So I think it will require potentially a more complex uh, structure. There are uh, structures called deep reservoir computing where we put many layers. Um, so, and they, they tend to separate scales. So we're advancing our knowledge in these types of methods and we're trying to find the right tools in order to be able to do that. And there was a follow on from Shiguang um, or another question, would DMD work for convective scales involving non-linear moist physics? My yeah, it depends on the time scale. So my guess would be if you're applying this along with other scales of longer time scale of interest, that DMD, you, you're applying in a single singular value decomposition. And so you basically filter out a lot of the high fast scales uh, and you're only looking at the large scale oscillations. So potentially if you were to keep many of the modes, you might be able to, um, but it, it generally decomposes the large scale high energy oscillations. And so I'm skeptical that it would be as useful for that. I see Jan's question. I, I, can we apply this to the UFS S2S? That, that is my long-term goal. So as we generate a long data set with the UFS for the reanalysis, we can start testing with that data and try to do uh, these data-driven models for the UFS. Okay, uh, I think uh, <laughs> we should end this uh, session so we don't take too many time from break. And we do have an announcement uh, from uh, our organizer. Uh, Catherine, please go ahead. Yeah, so we did have it come to our attention that the link to the, Go, uh, the Google Meet for the Earth System modeling session was incorrect in the email. Um, but if you go to the agenda, which I'm actually posting in the chat right now, um, that has the correct link for that session, as well as if you go into Slack, Weiwei has posted the proper link, um, both in the general and in the Earth System modeling channels. So um, be sure to uh, make sure that you find the right place for that session. Um, and so we're breaking now and we will revisit or reconvene in Google Meet for the four parallel sessions at uh, two o'clock Eastern. And so um, enjoy and we will see everybody again um, in the full plenary session at 3.15. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. And thanks everyone. See you in 20 minutes.